We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. It's a real pleasure to share with you some recent analysis regarding human-specific genes and genome structural variation. So our interest uh, in, in understanding human origins really stems from trying to understand the genetic differences that make us uniquely human. And of all the morphological changes that have occurred to us, the most interesting is the evolution of the human brain, and particularly the expansion of that brain, which has occurred over the last six million years, leading to essentially an increase in neuronal count increase in volume, and what's less controversial is an increase in synaptic density. So we're interested in understanding more complex forms of genetic variation, and I'm going to be talking for the most part today about the role of duplicated sequences. So duplicated sequences are a two-edged sword in our genome. On one hand, they provide pretty much the raw material for the evolution of new gene function. And the way this occurs is, in, and this is true for every species, is you have a gene, what we call a gene A, it becomes duplicated gene A prime, and additional mutations occur to lead to that new gene product we call now gene, gene B, either having new function or have actually acquired one of the other functions of gene A. So it is the primary force by which new genes evolve within species, and we're interested in looking at these events really from the most recent perspective. The other aspect of duplicated sequences is by dint of their homology, they can actually drive genomic instability. So the way this happens is, and I'm just showing you here two chromosomes that are misaligned in, during meiosis, is because of their high sequence identity, the chromosomes align where they shouldn't. A recombination event occurs, and when this occurs, this leads to essentially gametes, and you could imagine this as either egg or sperm, that have acquired or lost a duplicated sequence. So what's really important about human genomic architecture with respect to these duplicated sequences is we have a disproportionate number of our duplications actually interspersed. And so what that means is when this phenomena occurs and it leads to gains and losses of that duplicated sequence, it also leads to gains and losses of the intervening sequence, which is often gene rich and is represented by A, B, and C. And so if these genes are haploinsufficient, triplosensitive or imprinted, the result is disease. And there's close to 35 different genomic syndromes in the human species, mostly associated with autism and development of delay, that are a result of this type of unequal crossing over. So what do we know about human segmental duplication organization? Well, so segmental duplications refer to the most recent, highly identical duplications, greater than 90% identical. And this shows you with the blue lines, the pattern of intra chromosomal duplications in the human genome. So the one thing I want you to note is you can actually see that a lot of our duplications are separated from their nearest neighbor by often megabases of sequence. It turns out that on the order of 60% of all of our duplications are interspersed. That is to say they're separated by at least a megabase from their nearest neighbor or located on a completely different chromosome. So this is the pattern, and I know it's almost impossible to see, but this is the pattern of intrachromosomal duplications with biases near the ends of the chromosomes, which we call subtelomeric bias, biases toward the centromeric regions, which we call a paracentromeric bias. And what you can't see here is the short arms of human chromosomes we now know 
are loaded. In fact, more than 50% of their mass is made up of these duplicated sequences. So these duplications are highly interspersed in our genome. And what's important for this discussion is what you're looking at here is duplications that have evolved over the last 40 million years of primate evolution. Of these, there's about 1,100 protein coding genes of the, of the 20,000 that exist in our genome that are mapping. And these are the ones that we're specifically interested uh, for this discussion. So about 10 years ago, a former postdoc of mine named Thomas Marquez and myself, we started a project where we wanted to understand the genetic diversity in other uh, species other than humans. So we began a project to really sample the genomes of 79 wild and captive born great apes from chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutan, including an analysis of subspecies. And the goal was very straightforward here. We were gonna sequence with short read, in this case, Illumina technology, the genomes of these individuals, and try to use this information to identify all the fixed, shared, and polymorphic duplications that had emerged on all the different branches of the great apes, with a specific focus on trying to identify the duplications that were specific to the human lineage. So I'm not going to go into great detail on this because this is something that we presented uh, uh, now several years ago. But shown here is just a map of one of our chromosomes, chromosome 16. What I'm highlighting here in this color map is all the, all the duplicated sequences that exist in different apes. So what's represented here is each row represents a different individual. There are 10 rows corresponding to 10 humans that were actually characterized, 14 that correspond to the bonobo, which is indicated by the green air, air, large arrow, blue, the chimpanzee, Gorilla, there were 32 individuals that were analyzed, and orangutan, 17. So I hope you can get from this immediately that the actual copy number of the duplicated sequences indicated by this color that's shown here on the right. So the warmer the color, the higher the copy. Everything indicated in black means that it's not duplicated in that species. So very quickly, when you look at this, you can immediately, your eye can identify lineage-specific duplications, and really gives you an impression of how much turnover there has been in the different ape lineages. So here, for example, is a duplication that is human-specific. All humans have this duplicated segment, which is hundreds of kilobases, and no other ape has this. And you can find similarly things that are actually specific to the orang orangutan or the gorilla, as is this piece right here, and so on. So there's a couple of interesting points here. First off, there's a lot of variability, as we already mentioned, and there are regions that have extremely high copy number, which are highlighted here in terms of the red arrows. In terms of the amount of genetic change that has occurred between humans and other non-human apes, if you just count the number of megabases that are affected by single nucleotide variants versus the number that are affected by duplicated sequences in terms of copy number variation, you get 167 to 469 megabases. What this is telling you is that this type of mutational process is extremely common in the primate lineage. In fact, four times more bases are affected by signal duplication copy number variation than there are between SNPs. In terms of genes, 745 genes are affected by these, and at least 45 gene families we've identified that seem to be specific and fixed in the human lineage. The other really interesting thing that we still to this day don't have a good explanation for is that the rate of accumulation in terms of fixed duplications is non-uniform across the different branches. So this is a generally accepted tree of the relationship all the way from the Asian apes or the great apes known as the orangutan all the way down to humans, chimps, and gorillas. And the thickness of the line that I'm showing you here is the number of fixed duplicated bases that have been added for every substituted single nucleotide base on this branch. So the one thing I want you to get, other than the fact that these, these thicknesses are not uniform across the species, is that there seems to be a huge excess that has occurred in a common ancestral lineage leading to humans, chimps, and gorillas. So one way to think about this is that for every base pair that's been mutated in the different primate lineages around this time, there were 2.6 bases that had become copy number variable, largely as a result of duplication process. So duplications have actually reshaped in very subtle ways the genomes of humans, chimps, and gorillas.
So what about the human specific genes? Well, this is a subset of those human specific genes. And I'm not going to go into great detail on the gene and the gene families, but this is just to show you the copy number estimations that we have in terms of the number of copies that have been seen in different human population groups. And the gray indicate the copy number that we see in chimps, orangutan, and gorilla. So two would be consistent with a diploid genome, which means it's not duplicated. So you can see this variability, but perhaps the most interesting thing is if we look at the gene families, what we find is that there's a notable enrichment of human-specific genes that are associated with the development of the human brain. So since those discoveries over the last decade, our group and several other groups has actually systematically begun to characterize these genes. And there's now close to a half a dozen gene families that have been identified that are associated with properties that would be consistent with the expansion of the human brain. One of the first was this slit robo GTPase activating protein called SIRGAP2C, which evolved about two to three million years ago on the human branch. It created a truncated protein that heterodimerizes with its ancestral function to alter the dendrite morphology, the density of synapses, and then more recent data, long range connectivity differences in the human brain. There was another gene that was particularly worked on by uh, Wieland Huttner from the Max Planck Institute called RGAP11B. It emerged quite early in the evolution of the human after separation from chimp about 4 million years ago. And this gene appears to have acquired an entirely new function. It increases the number of basal radial glial cells in the developing brain. These are progenitors of neurons. And as a result, increase neuronal count and expand the subventricular zone, at least based on transgenic experiments that have been done in non-human uh, primates. BOLA2B is a very interesting gene. It's probably the youngest duplication. Uh, it is so young, it actually distinguishes essentially humans from Neanderthals. So this is the largest genetic difference that exists in the species Homo sapiens that distinguishes us from Neanderthals and Denisova. Uh, what's interesting about this is this gene isn't necessarily associated with any changes in brain function but is, in, is associated with increased stability in iron homeostasis intracellularly, which may be important in terms of metabolism, specific in environments where iron may be, be, be uh, low levels. Notch2NL is a gene discovered and characterized uh, in part by Ian Fittis from David Hauser's group. It's once again a partial duplication expressed in radioglial cells. And in this particular case, it interacts and interferes with its ancestral function, Notch2, and delays neuronal progenitor differentiation. And finally, TBC1D3 is a gene that was identified a few years back. It's similar to RGAP11B, appears to pr increase the prolifer proliferation of basal ne neural progenitors. And it actually increases cortical folding. It's thought by suppressing histone methyltransferases. But I think I want to kind of emphasize that there's this kind of this bias that we see in terms of the duplicated sequences being incredibly important for the evolution of really the human brain, at least based on functional data. At the same time that those duplications are actually leading to the evolution of new genes with new functions in the human lineage, there's evidence that of the five examples that I highlighted, that four of them are also associated with human disease specifically increasing the rate of rearrangements associated with autism, epilepsy, and developmental delay. So for example, that RGAP11B gene that I described is part of a duplication block that predisposes to one of the most common causes of rearrangements associated with generalized idiopathic epilepsy in children. The BOLA2B, which occurs maps to chromosome 16P1 2.1, is part of a 600 kilobase duplication that predisposes to microdeletion and microduplication of that region, creating the second most common cause of autism in the human species. Notch2NL causes a recurrent microdeletion or is part of a duplication that is associated with a recurrent microdeletion associated with micro and macrocephaly and pediatric disease in children. And finally, TBC1D3 is a gene family that exists at two locations and rearrangements between those two gene families is associated with a pediatric form of renal cyst and kidney disease.
So I emphasize these two things because these highlight a juxtaposition that exists in our genome. We have created these new genes as a result of duplications, but we've also added a lability to our species, now predisposing us to having children with developmental delay, autism, and epilepsy. So everything that I showed you up to this point was based on trying to characterize duplicated sequences largely indirectly. And there has been a fundamental limitation of all sequencing of ape genomes until recently, is that they're riddled with gaps. And in fact, the gaps map specifically to the duplicated regions. And so many of the genes that we identified as actually being important were not even sequenced and assembled as part of the original human genome project. So over the last five years, we've been applying new sequencing technology known as long read sequencing. And we've been doing it to systematically build up the ape or non-human ape genomes to get a better catalog of all the structural and genetic differences that have occurred in not only duplicated sequences, but in complex regions of the genome. So I'm not gonna go with, into all the technical details in terms of how this was achieved, and I'd be happy to discuss with people later about this. But the take home is this, is we're now at a point, instead of actually inferring changes that have occurred in our lineage with respect to others, that we can now sequence almost entirely the chromosomes of chimps, gorillas and orangutans completely. And so what I'm showing you here is a view comparing the complete sequence, telomere to telomere of a human chromosome 11 compared to that of the bonobo. And anywhere you see large scale differences indicated here by white, um, they correspond to, to massive changes that have occurred in our genome. So in some areas of the genome, we expect this kind of rapid turnover, such as the centromeres, but in others, these often are gene-rich regions that we now can fully sequence characterize for the first time. So this is one example. This is another example. This is the short arm of chromosome 16, just to give you a comparison of how much large scale structural changes. So this is mega basis of sequence that have changed between the bonobo pygmy chimp and that of the human. So the really important point is now with long read sequencing technology, we can go back to those non-human apes and more thoroughly characterize all the structural changes that have shaped our genomes. And so this is what we've been doing. So we've been busy over the last three or four years, actually sequencing many different non-human primates. Uh, so we've actually characterized now eight different genomes, not quite at telomere to telomere level, but very close to it. And we're actually building out a complete map of all the structural variant changes that have occurred on each branch. So just to give you a little idea of what you're looking at here, these are the different branches, the new world monkeys indicated here. This is the gibbon. This is an example of an old world monkey and then the apes below. The red indicate deletions that have occurred on each of these branches that are fixed. The blue indicate insertions that have occurred on the different branches. And the squares that are highlighted here indicate the number of genes that have been affected in a lineage specific manner by structural variant processes. So there's two numbers here, and that might seem a little bit confusing, but we broke out these two numbers to really highlight sites of the genome. So in this case, there are 223 structural changes that affected the gene structure in a branch leading to essentially the, uh, in this case, the owl monkey, but there are 156 that are unique. And so the rest of these that are the difference between 223 and 156 have been seen somewhere else in the primate lineage. So we've so far cataloged and sequence resolve 1.3 million structural changes that are fixed. 1,561 genes are affected. And what's surprising to us is about 25% of these changes are recurrent. That is to say they're occurring multiple times in different primate lineages, leading to fixed differences as if there are specific regions of a genome that are more apt to undergo rapid change. The other thing that we've been able to do very recently in the last two years is begin to look at methylation structure of these regions. So as many of you know, methylation is often a good indication of what's being transcribed and what isn't being transcribed. And what we've been able to do is look at the pattern of methylation in the duplicated regions and specifically CPG methylation that is coming from Oxford nanopore. And what we've been able to do is distinguish active genes, which are indicated or inactive genes indicated here as untranscribed, 
from active genes, which indicated here is highly transcribed. And there's a very characteristic properties that distinguish those. So looking at the 1,200 or so duplicated genes highlighted here in red, we see that there's a very characteristic feature, which is that the transcription start site is hypomethylated, so a low level is CPG methylation, while the gene body shows high levels of methylation. And why that's important is we can now go to individual genes that are virtually identical, such as this gene family called NPIP, and we can distinguish the active copies, in this case A9 and A1 with their 69 and 57 transcripts, versus inactive, in this case NPIP A5 and NPIP A7. And you can see that the methylation patterns here are very diagnostic. So I'm really excited by this because we now have the ability to look at not only the complete sequence of the duplicated genes, but actually how they are regulated in different tissues for the first time. The other thing we can do is we can go back to these genetic changes and we can fully sequence resolve the structure, the, the differences that exist between the chimp and the human. And so as an example, I'm showing you here a part of chromosome 17, which is the human is along the top and the chimpanzee in the bottom, and then there's a blow up below. But this is a region of the genome which has expanded dramatically in the human branch since separation. And there's been an expansion of this gene family TBC1D3. Now, if you remember in the very beginning of the presentation, I told you that TBCD3 was one of those genes that's been implicated in actually increasing the number of basal radioglial cells, increasing the number of neurons that exist in our genome. And yet there's this dramatic expansion in the number of genes in chimp versus essentially human. So now that we've sequenced the genomes of in this case, I'm showing you here macaque, orangutan, and gorilla, chimpanzees, and humans, we can go back, back and ask questions about the evolutionary history of this gene family. And there are surprises. So I told you before that it was a human-specific expansion, and that is true. So when we build a phylogenetic tree of the different copies labeled here all the way to, through A through, through L, you can see that there is truly a human expansion of this gene, and specifically compared to that of the bonobon chimp. However, when we go and look at gorilla, orangutan, and macaque, we see that this exact same gene has actually expanded independently in those lineages, which is a bit of a surprise for us because we, had, we were under, under the impression that this would be just a human-specific gene family, at least compared to essentially that of uh, the chimpanzee. The timing of the duplication is consistent with the frontal expansion, the frontal cortical expansion two to two and a half million years ago with the most recent ones occurring in the last million years. But it's clear that the gene family has been prone to independent duplications in different ape lineages. Um, and the basis for this or the consequence of this is largely unknown. The other surprising thing is now that we've been able to sequence this locus in its entirety, we've been able to go back and look at different humans and different human haplotypes. So I'm showing you here six different human haplotypes. So each of these represents a different region uh, or a, a, the same region or allelic portion of this chromosome. And the red arrows indicate the actual TBC1D3, that gene that's thought to be important in terms of expansion of the frontal cortex. And you can see that every human that we sequenced has, in this case, chimp has no copies at this locus, has an increase compared to chimpanzee. But the real surprising thing to us, at least, is how much variability there is between humans and massive variability. So this is a, a simpler way to look at many more humans. So you're looking here at about 80 different humans. And what I'm indicating here is the copy number range that exists for one of these loci that carries this gene TBC1D3 and its range and copy from 5 to 25, depending upon the human that you've sampled. And the part that puzzles us is how can a gene that is so important in terms of building a bigger brain, at least with respect to, to chimpanzee, as the literature would suggest, could be so variable in the human population? We don't have the answer yet, but I am highlighting this as an example of probably one of the most dynamic and heterogeneous regions in terms of heterozygosity in the human genome and the new information that's coming from long read sequencing. So in conclusion, the focus of this uh, is supposed to be the future anthropogeny, a future of anthropogeny.
I guess if I was going to stress anything is that we're now on the cusp of complete genetic information from humans with respect to non-human apes. So far, we've ca cataloged about 1.3 million fixed structural changes over the last 40 million years of primate evolution. And there's a common theme of recurrence, i.e. the same genes being affected multiple times as if they're being reused in multiple primate lineages to perhaps accomplish different things uh, in each of the primate lineages. We now have the ability to study at the sequence level the birth of new genes. And I think the focus on recent signal duplications is allowing us to do this for the first time, um, really to understand differences between our lineage and other, all other apes, but also the variation within species and how these genes are regulated. And so if I could imagine a future, maybe this is 10, 10 years out, but I don't think it's that far, with the ability to now sequence telomere to telomere, or very nearly so, telomere to telomere, of every human and great ape genome that we can actually access, we have the potential to reconstruct the evolutionary history of each base in the human genome, irrespective of whether it's a single base pair change or a large-scale duplication. And that, I think, will transform not just really the field of anthropogeny, but actually, I would say, evolution more fundamentally. So these are all the folks who actually have been involved in some of the, the latest work that I presented, uh, various postdocs and students from my group, but also my collaborators, Adam Philippi and Karen Miga at NIH and UCSC, and great collaborators at Penn State. Uh, we've been working on actually sequencing more and more non-human apes and other non-human primate genomes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's really a great pleasure to be here today. Today, I'm going to talk about a very small portion of our work that has to do with providing an evolutionary perspective on human cognitive and behavioral variation. So, of course, the major framing of this is that the brain is the most important organ you have, according to the brain. And again, this tongue-in-cheek slide really speaks to the importance of the brain in making us human, who we are. We're probably the only organism on Earth um, whose brain would come up with this little slogan. Before I get into the outline of the talk, I just want to frame and make a few really key points that underlie, you could call them themes. Human cognition and behavior are part of normal human variation, so-called human condition. But the same thing with disorders, such as neuropsychiatric disorders and autism spectrum conditions that impact these human phenotypes or human conditions, part of normal human variation. We know that most aspects of human cognition, behavior, and brain structure are highly heritable as well. And although they're subject to major environmental effects, genetics really provides us with an anchor of understanding the mechanisms of development and function of the brain. And advances in understanding the genetic contributions to the neuropsychiatric diseases now permit us to begin to understand how risk for these disorders relates to other human phenotypes and human brain evolution. So what I'm gonna to touch on today and I'll summarize right here. The human brain, specifically regions of the neocortex, have expanded substantially relative to what would be expected based on body size. This reflects changes in cell number, morphology, as well as composition. So I'm going to ask and answer two questions to some degree. Can we leverage comparative genomics, that is comparing different species, to understand the genes and mechanisms behind these evolutionary changes? And secondly, is normal variation in human brain function, and by extension, risk for neuropsychiatric disorders, a consequence of factors that underlie distinctly human adaptations in cognition and behavior? So one of the first things to know is that human variability in cognition and behavior is related to expansion of the neocortex, and in fact, specific highly interconnected regions in the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. This is from a paper in 2013, and the orange regions are the most highly variable regions, and they're in the 
frontal lobe in the front and the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and one can see the sensory motor cortex being the least variable. So individual variation in cortical network connectivity, this is showing how these brain regions connect to each other, underlies cognitive and behavioral variability. Things like personality traits, cognition, language, executive function, anxiety, etc. And what's interesting is that these same regions are those that have expanded the most on the human lineage. That is, the, our variability comes from the expansion of these regions. And this is just shown here quantitatively. You can see that inner subject variability in network activity and connectivity is related to its evolutionary surface cortical expansion. So the most variable brain regions, the frontal temporal parietal association regions in humans, are those that have also expanded the most on the human lineage. This is a tongue-in-cheek title of a review that I wrote with one of my mentors, Pashko Rakic, now almost a decade ago. Cortical evolution judged the brain by its cover. In other words, again, the cerebral cortex being the seat of uh, a lot, not all, of human uh, brain adaptations related to our unique aspects of language, cognition, and behavior. And there are a lot of phenotypes associated with that. And I just list some of them here. Again, this is about a decade ago. You can see on the left that many of these quantitative differences are actually related to the development of the brain, the length of the cell cycle, cortical neurogenesis, because the neurons in the brain, and the brain is essentially built early on, all the cells are born prenatally. And another piece is that there's very prolonged development, both in utero and ex utero, after birth. We have, we have profoundly longer childhood and adolescence. And in fact, the mechanism for some of this is beginning to be understood. And here's a nice little diagram of how some of cortical expansion has actually occurred and related to cell cycle and cell divisions. And this is just showing rodent, non human primate, and human from um, my colleague, Jenna Konopka, and it shows the expansion of the green cells, which is called the subventricular zone. And actually this region of progenitors expands hugely in primates, even more so in humans than non-human primates, and gives rise to the later born projection neurons in the upper layers of the cortex, layers two and three, and, and uh, to some extent in visual cortex as well, the expanded layer four as well. And these cells are involved primarily in cortical cortical connectivity in most brain regions. That is connecting the hemispheres uh, to each other and, and different cortical regions to each other. So we have this expansion of these cortical regions. We have some notion of beginning of how they develop and that the origins are likely at least partially developmental. How do we kind of connect them to genetics? So DNA sequence or structural chromosomal differences provide a key foundation for understanding primate evolution. Phenotype differences between the species are thought to reflect significant differences in the regulation of gene expression and not necessarily the structure of genes themselves. In other words, the proteins. And this was uh, initially described in a very influential paper in Science in 1975, King and Wilson, evolution at two levels in humans and chimpanzees, the two levels being that the macromolecules have some changes, but that most of the changes are occurring in gene regulation. However, definitively connecting DNA changes to brain function is challenged by showing that variants actually affect the brain. In other words, you have the DNA, you can see all this genetic variation. How do you know which ones are actually affecting the brain and how do you show that they are indeed doing that? And so we and others have done a lot of work for the last 20 years and, and, and kind of re I want to kind of rethink the evolution at two levels, kind of riffing off that wonderful um, and, and, and seminal paper, that expansion of higher order cortical circuitry that is, the connectivity of these brain regions that have expanded underlies human cognitive specialization, higher order association areas, that is, things involved in language, planning, frontal executive function, and their connections. But it's not only just the expansion. It's within these regions we and others have found evidence for increased cellular and molecular complexity 
That is, the cells are larger, the dendritic trees are bigger, and molecularly, the networks and pathways involved are much more complex. So both brain region circuits and the cellular and molecular complexity within frontal lobe have adaptively evolved in humans. So again, this is a wonderful uh, picture from more than a decade ago from my colleague, Katrina Semendeferi, one of the organizers of this symposium. And I just show this to show the massive difference in the, in the spacing between cells. So it's not just that there are more cells and more connections, their, their architecture is just fundamentally different. The dendritic trees of, of uh, projection neurons in humans is larger, et cetera. So we have these molecular differences as well as the, these connectivity differences. The network is just bigger as well, in addition to its components being more complex. So how do we get there? Development is a process that involves genes interacting with the environment, leading to a cerebral structure. This is not a static structure, it's a dynamic structure. It involves multiple levels from molecular all the way to gross anatomy. And this underlies behavior and cognition which also feeds back, changing the cerebral structure as we learn and age and grow, et cetera. And so understanding development is really essential to understanding um, cerebral structure. Another point I wanna bring up is that broad risk, genetic risk for psychiatric disorders preferentially impacts this period of fetal development. This is just another piece of evidence that this period is extremely important for behavior and cognition in humans as well as creating susceptibility in these areas that are so important. Here's some work with the eyesight group that we did. Basically, instead of treating autism and schizophrenia as different disorders, we take all the six major disorders from ADHD, affective disorder, anorexia, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism. And if you have any one of those, you're affected. And we find multiple genome-wide significant loci affecting susceptibility for all of, for mental illness in general. And we look to see when this is expressed, you can see the brain expression of these genes is much higher prenatally than postnatally. In fact, peaking around mid-gestation, the peak of cortical neurogenesis and migration. And in a later paper that's much larger with the uh, psychiatric GWAS consortium, essentially we see the same thing. So how do we go from genomic variant to gene? How do we go from changes in the genome to understanding what their actually impact is? And here we rely on functional genomic annotations, such as from the um, understanding what these non-coding regions of the brain of the genome are. So 95% of the genome is non-coding, only about 4% codes for proteins. So most of what's going on is in regulatory sequence that's driving the expression, splicing, timing. And this biology is driven by gene regulation that occurs at the cell type and tissue level. So we can't have a generic view of this. We have to study the actual tissue of interest. And so the problem is with the brain, and especially the human fetal brain, 10 years ago, there was really no map connecting genetic variation through these epigenetic annotations to understand what was functional during fetal human brain development, what these, and, and, and what genes these functional elements were actually um, um, interacting with and, and regulating. And I just put up this title, No Maps for These Territories, because it's a, it's a movie that my uh, wife and I um, helped make with the director, Mark Neal, with William Gibson now quite a long time ago and its title was No Maps for These Territories. And you may know that William Gibson is a science fiction writer who coined the term cyberspace and is really a visionary in science fiction. And so I kind of use this as, a, as our mantra, no maps for these territories, we have to make them. And the folks listed below, when they were postdocs in the lab, and they're all now out running their own labs, uh, basically built this map. So we wanted to generate a reference map of gene regulation during human neurogenesis based on dynamic chromatin accessibility and structure. The whole idea is to figure out what all this non-coding region was doing and what's really critical for brain development. So what genes are expressed, what regions of the genome are active, what genes do they regulate, and how do they regulate them?
And so when we find regions that are active during fetal brain, we can then take disorders um, in which genome-wide association studies have been done or any human phenotype, like brain volume, intracranial volume at the bottom, or educational attainment, how far in school you've gone, as well as disorders like autism, schizophrenia, depressive symptoms, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And what we see is that even for some adult disorders or later onset disorders, such as depression, there's a substantial impact of the genetic variation that predisposes for these, dis for these conditions or these phenotypes, sits preferentially, is enriched in regions that are active during fetal brain development, especially the case for educational attainment, neuroticism, depression, of course, intracranial volume, because that's how the brain is, cells are actually born. And actually, when we look um, with, um, with Jason Stein, who was a postdoc in the lab, but this is done in his lab at UNC Chapel Hill, we can actually see that when we look at chromatin expression quantitative trait loci, just saying regions that are, that are changing during fetal brain development, especially in these neural progenitors, the things that give rise to the neurons in the brain, massively enriched for a wide range of uh, human traits, ranging from IQ and educational attainment to autism and neuroticism. So what aspects of this genetic and epigenetic regulation during fetal brain development have developed on the human lineage? So I'm going to focus on two obvious kind of low-hanging fruit. One of them is genetic. They're called human accelerated regions, or HARs. These are regions that are strongly conserved across mammals and vertebrates, but, but in humans have changed more than any other lineage. So they've, their changing has accelerated on the human lineage. So they're functional, but changing a lot. Then on the epigenetic side, there are things called enhancers that turn genes on. And these are another form of regulatory element. Now the HARs strongly overlap with known developmental enhancers, but a human gained enhancer is something that's more active on the human lineage. It's an enhancer that might be there in mouse and in chimpanzee and in macaque, but it's much more active in human brain. And so we can look both and compare HARs and identify what they overlap with in human fetal brain. We can look at human gained enhancers that are gained in fetal brain. We can also look at those human gained enhancers and what, whether they're active in adult brain. And so the genes that are regulated by HARs and HGE are expressed most in this cell type called ORG right here and a little bit in endothelial cells as well. But the ORG, that is the region I showed you before that is responsible for the expansion of the cortex in primates and in humans. That's the subventricular zone. And so here we're connecting the actual biological mechanism of expansion of the cortex, this expansion of the outer radioglia in the subventricular zone with a human adapted genetic cat, you know, category, let's say these HARs and HGEs. So we're able to kind of connect these and they're both impacting the same way. So the notion is that these HARs and HGEs are kind of responsible in driving this kind of expansion of the cortex. And again, now we can look later in development if it's the case that these HARs and HGEs are driving the expansion of the layers two and three, which are, which are the regions that have massively expanded in humans, then we expect them to be enriched. And indeed, they are. We can see that HARs and the fetal brain, HGEs especially, are enriched. So elements that are being selected on the human lineage converge on cerebral cortical expansion and gyrification, which is the expansion of these layers two, three. So how does this relate to susceptibility for human disorders? Is this related to any aspect of cognitive function? And in fact, human gained enhancers regulate genes that are related to human intellectual function as well. And this is shown here. 
in this paper that was led by Hei Jung Wan when she was a postdoc in my laboratory. The idea here is we use chromatin interactions to identify the regulatory relationships. And we find using this technique called high c that genes that are connected to these human gained enhancers shown on the left. So this is a, you can see the peak here, which shows the activity of the enhancer in fetal human brain compared to rhesus or mouse. That would be a gained enhancer where there's a huge difference. So if we take those and connect them to genes using this chromatin interaction data, we see that now if we take genes that are defined using this chromatin interaction, that those that are enriched in the germinal zone and cortical plate of the developing cerebral cortex are, are enriched with a curated list of genes that cause intellectual development. In fact, if we just take those in fetal brain together, we see this huge, highly significant enrichment. And if we just didn't use the high C, if we didn't connect the regulatory regions to their proper genes and just let them sit near their closest genes, we don't see anything. And this includes genes that are known to be a cause of small brain. This is just one example here. And what I'm showing in the neck here is these TADs, which are regions in which 95% of regulatory interactions occur. Then above it is the negative log TAD and P value of the chromatin conformation contact. So this big peak is showing that this evolutionary gained enhancer, this HGE, is acting on this gene RGAP11B. Well, RGAP11B arose from a duplication of this other RGAP form on the human lineage and is purported to promote progenitor self-renewal. So this is one of the probably many mechanisms by which these human gained elements are regulating, adapt, in this case, a gene that's actually been adapted on the human lineage to actually expand the cortex. Now, Chris Walsh's lab showed around the same time, looking at HARS, not HGEs, that HARS, these human accelerated regions are enriched in mutations that cause autism spectrum disorders in a quite remarkable paper published in Cell. So to kind of tie things up, we can ask, now that we have been studying autism for two decades using modern genetics, when and where do genes that impact social cognition and mental flexibility and language that cause autism actually lie? And they, we've shown in several papers, as have others, that these genes that are mutated in autism act during fetal brain development, and they impact the pathways of transcriptional regulation, that is things that turn genes on and off, as well as synaptic development, but during, during fetal life. Secondarily, when we look to see what cells these genes are expressed in, they're primarily expressed in the superficial, supergranular layers from layer two to three and a little bit in layer four. So then it's not surprising that both classes of these human adapted elements, active in fetal brain, regulate cortical expansion and constrain genes that give rise that when they're mutated, increase risk for autism as well as developmental delay and intellectual disability. And that's shown here. These HARS, human gained enhancers in fetal brain, you can see this enrichment in genes that show strong constraint on the human lineage that are depleted of mutations in humans, those that cause de novo loss of function. And again, this is another measure of constraint. So it suggests that changes in regulatory sequence is one mode of sequence evolution that allows highly constrained developmental genes to kind of change their expression and be involved in cortical expansion. So in summary, genes related to the expansion of the human cerebral cortex are under control of human-specific DNA regulatory elements these have most impact on expansion of cortical regions that underlie human cognitive and behavioral variability. And these same human regulatory regions also impact intellectual function and risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, including 
ASD, and schizophrenia, which, like other human disorders, are on a continuum with a range of human trait variation. The notion is that part of the part of our gain and part of what's evolved to make us human also can be a source of human variability and in some ways vulnerability. I'm really grateful to Carta for inviting me and giving me this opportunity and to those in my lab who are listed here whose work I've talked about as we've gone through, especially Hei Jung Wan, Jason Stein, and Luis de la Torre Ubieda, and Rebecca Walker, who did the majority of this work, as well as our funders. Thank you very much for your attention.